Hello, friends. Welcome to the Tell It Like It Is podcast, and I'm your host, Alexi Bailey. And today I have a very special guest, Victor Mao. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I'm, uh, it's, my ple- it's a pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. And it's a very beautiful Friday in October. We're getting close to the winter. How are you, how are you feeling? How do you deal with the winter? I think the winter is definitely like the seasons are for me, like for me first moved to the East Coast because uh, uh, when I first came to this country, I was landed in California. So like seasons are much much uh, of a thing at all. But when I move over here, I realized the winter has, you know, it's a bit harsh. Uh, it's got, it, get, it can get really cold. And I think one of the ways to deal with that is just to like ramp up the physical activities um, just to, yeah, to change the mood because when it's cold outside and you naturally just don't want to go outside and don't want to move around. And sometimes that's all it takes for you to feel a little bit better. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jamaican and I'm still not used to the winter. And I've been here for, 20, 20 something years. Yeah, the, yeah, it's definitely crazy. But I don't know. It's, uh, it's also beautiful at the same time. You know, it's, uh, I really like it when there's four seasons going all the time. And you just, you just get to experience all of it. And I think that's good too. Um, yeah, I think that that kind of like four seasons actually fits like california weather i think because it gives a variety and i don't think you know if if you stay at summer all the time i think that just that gets the same you know you just feel the same you don't feel any difference and i think that changing weather really you know in a way it changes your mood too like you know when you are in summer you are more energetic you wanted to go out you want to social with friends and when it's autumn, you get to like appreciate, um, it's like a season of harvest, like a family time, like, you know, when you smell the chimneys, like, yeah, I think those, you know, those are the little things that make life more, more real in a way. Yeah. And winter is what, a planning season? Winter, I feel like it's more, you know, everybody is staying inside and trying to um like trying to gather all the resources and prepare for the yeah i think that i guess planning for the new year for the spring to come and you know spring is always the season of life and we like in my culture in chinese culture we have a big thing about uh spring festival that we celebrate every year so that's basically our christmas our version of christmas um So, you know, like family gathering, eating food and celebrating the the life, new life, new year. So, you know, thank you for taking the time. You know, so much of what I try to do is expose my audience to diverse backgrounds and expose myself and have have, uh, meaningful conversations. Um, a a lot of what I tend to talk about is the way that the world is going, you know, talking about the important things that matters and what it all means, right? I think I've had so many moments with people who, who were everyday people, but they were so insightful that I was like, wow, you know, I think we all have have some some important piece of the puzzle and i think we can move forward a lot faster if we listen to each other um yes i really go out of my way to have diverse voices because you never know who's going to say what and how that's going to help someone else that's true that's true and i think the only way the only way to bring out that is you know through authenticity and you know, the conversation for my is definitely the way to go. Uh, you know, people can get to know you more by a lo- longer form of conversation, like rather than like 
like bits of information, like a snapshot of everything. Um, so, you know, the audience really got to know the true perspective or POV of the, of the person that you're interviewing too. So you were born and raised in China, is that right? Yes, yes. I was born and raised in China and I came to States at about like 14, like uh, eighth grade. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about being Chinese American? I think it's definitely a new, like a very new identity because I think the, <clears throat> one of the things that's very different is that in China, it's, uh, it's not that diverse. I mean, it's not diverse at all. Like by, by meaning is wherever you go, you see Chinese people. You don't see any other race. You don't see, you barely see any foreigners there. Like we call them foreigners, but you know, like people from other countries and yeah, but so like you're in a very, you don't really think of yourself as Chinese per se, because that's everybody around you is that. Right. Um, when you're in States, yeah, there's, um, especially I think, you know, Western society, everything is very boxed, every category, very labeled. And I like it some, in some ways because it really, you know, when you label something, it keeps everything like systematic, like organized. And I think there's definitely like being, like I didn't even realize I was belong to this group until I'm in it for like a long time. I realized, oh yeah, I, you know, that's actually me. But I think that's, it's a very interesting experience for me to like actually like realize my, my identity in the society. It's, very different from the identity that I had before. And I think that that was a, that was a weird transition too, um, because I would never, I guess I, I never considered myself as a minority per se. Um, so like when I, when I was here, I was like, mm, yeah, maybe, you know, there's just so much diversity going on. I guess everyone is somewhat of a minority in their own group. And I think that's, you know, that really strike me like one time I'm, I'm, I'm actually a minority here, but yeah, that, but that experience is, um, it's, uh, it's really like, it's a transition, but I, I'll, I'll say like, it's very interesting for me to like have the self-awareness to know, oh, this is it. It's me. I fit into the bo this box. I, I do. And I do like, I, I used to think that I don't, um, yeah, but I do. Do you read and write Mandarin? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, writing is not, not so much. I mean, I, I do still write. Like the right. other day I was sending a package to my, to my parents and I was supposed to write down the address and I found myself like having a little bit difficulty like just writing the characters just because I haven't practiced in a, in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something beautiful about language and to the extent that you can hold on to that and preserve it, that's a huge resource that can come in handy for the rest of your life, you know? Sure, for yeah. sure. I think that's, yeah, fun. Like I still very much keep up with my, like everything going on back home too. Like not as in like entertainment wise, but more like news, politics, I think those are the things I'm more inclined to read these days because yeah, I feel like other, other, like those two things are more universal, like a universal language, it's like music. It's like if a song is good, it's going to be top chart in China as well, as well as America. And yeah, I think, yeah, but the entertainment system is very, very different like from China to, to here. It's like in China, there's more, I think like live shows, like real live shows, you know, like uh, reality TV, but it's very like, it's apparently staged. So yeah, if you, I mean, you know, there's uh, what's, a lot what's of my this friends. Thing, um, this social credit. Oh, okay. So the social credit is, it's actually kind of scary if you think about it because they are, so, you know, like, um, in US, you have Venmo's, 
you have other apps that you know cash app to transfer money to i think they inch like that's how they started like that's how the whole social spread is is based on so china as a country is actually very young i mean in terms of this new politic leadership under uh, chinese communist party but it has a long history but like the i guess the party only ruled it for i think it was like what 70 years 70 years that's nothing that's a quarter of uh, i mean a third of us history so they don't have a robust credit system to to lend out money for people to do more business and they do want to like eventually be like us to have the ability to give out small business loans to incentivize the whole market to do better and i think one of the first ways that they did is to is to a messaging app called wechat and that's like your whatsapp version and uh so first you are able to text without sending an sms so you don't have to pay for messaging so like people adopt it very earlier and then they inch it even more to like oh make your life easier you know they have a building small app within the app as in like a uber like so like you can call food you can call cars so the money comes in so that's when they you know that's when they get you so when you when you link it with your bank account then in order for it to be convenient you will want some money into it right into the app and then they can track your spending they will, they will show your spending breakdowns everything and then now there are basically the social credit okay so the social credit the credit system in the US at least from what i learned before mm-hmm. it's more based on how much asset how much liability that you have and so in china they don't have a system to track that at all like the banking system is very sporadic like there's no there is a central bank but banks and banks don't talk to each other mm. so with this with this new app they were able to collect all user information on a very personal level um including your like basically your ssn you have to in like a personal ID number. Mm-hmm. So like that can use as a, you know, unique key to find out all the information about you, including what cars you bought, what, what car loan you have, what, which places are you travel, how frequently are you traveling? And then they will use all these data points to basically predict how reliable are you in, in this is a how, like how much, how, how much should we give you money? So like, that's one of the index that they came out. I think it's very scary because, you know, the big data, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of like a data guy and I really like doing data modeling and just looking at how precisely those models can predict our, our behaviors a lot of times. And I think that's, but I think China is taking it in a way that it's trying to let the data shape the user's behavior. Which I think it's um, you know it's 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 a really really weird way to do it about it, um, because it actually can change, and you will, and nobody knows what's the you know the the I guess the lingering effect of that, and yeah, so I think I think that's one of the things that my parents always say make their life very easy and convenient because you know the this is a one stop app that you go in. You can pay rent. You can do anything. You can loan money. You can buy cars. But the thing about it that's very scary is that then it knows everything. It it knows everything, and that's you know it's a little bit that unsettling. That also tracks your your good deeds and your community things. I like think that. that's yeah. That's the thing that they are trying to do, but. It's, if you think about it, it's actually very hard to judge an action as good or bad. But for a computer, what they do right now, like, because I'm really following up on the tech trend in China. So like, I kind of getting a little bit understanding of the, how they broke, build their algorithm. So they basically have a, have a keyword check. They will look at every post that you post on your social medias mm-hmm. because they, will, they can always link down to your 
to your personal ID, right? So they know each post that you did. And they're going to scan the post for any violent words, any um, sexual words, any words against the government, you know. Um, yeah, I think those are the top three things that they are mm -hmm. looking for. So that actually is very crazy because I also follow like a lot of bloggers in China. So that when they put on subtitles, when you say blood, like blood, um, as in like blood runs in your vein, it's actually, uh, it's like, it's a negative point, basically, well, that's what it is. So you will decrease your video, video views and then you'll also kind of dock your social credit. So they were like, they will put a, what we call like a ping in. So that's like a, um, it's like a few character to like, if you know the language, you will know what they say, but they just can't put the word on the screen, which I think is very insane because that's the word. Like, why do you want to change the word? And yeah, I think that's, but that's also happening in the States too. Um, just not in the, not in a way that, you know, the system is going to dock you, but like the general audience will dock you. They will find it. They will find it like uh, what we call like trigger warning in the new Gen Z world. Right. Um, yeah. So I think, I think, I think the actual same thing is, you know, it's very interesting to see two cultures, how they sync up in those social phenomena. Are your parents okay with it? Are most people okay with it or? I think they're pretty okay with it. I mean, they they find it very convenient. They can just shop. They can do anything. For them, they are not really thinking of giving up the personal liberty because I guess there there is no thought of personal liberty in in China. I think it's very very much still a very like you have you you have to say like communism society. Right. It's that's the education, that's the indoctrination. So they basically kick the self thought in you, out of you. So you don't even think about that. So most time you are only consider the greater good, but the greater good, like we all learn in philosophy class, like what is the greater good? Like greater good is intangible. It's a thing that we all agreed on, but who, but you, you like, at the end of the day, it has to be something, right? But like, so that I think that's the fallacy of that thinking. But you know, the education really gets you. It really gets you. They will be teaching you, you know, like always work as a team. So that's I think that's why, like a lot of times, like even now when I'm working in companies and I see other like Chinese co colleagues, I think they are they're very good, very very good team players. They, you know, they will always sacrifice themselves, like their personal liberty, personal time to like, in order to meet a deadline. But I also, at the same time, I think that's, you know, that's not really good. Not only for them, but also for other, like other people at their same level. So like they are basically breaking the game in a way right. because they want to, you know, because they can sacrifice anything, but not everybody was willing to do that. And so, yeah, that's just something that I realized. I was like, hmm, like I'm a little bit different now, like from people who are just here from for college and then they, they go to work. But then the mindset is always there. Like the mindset is always home, how I behave at home, what, yeah, who, who I should be at home, but I'm here, in here. Well, where I think America has praises the individual and it's individualistic and growing up the the priority was the collectivistic and working together in the greater team and not just the individual. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely one of the shocking things for me. So what's what what's. China makes most of the things, right? That the world uses. Yeah. And I think, you know, most people think that China is like growing, getting bigger. It's the new big superpower. America's, you know, number two to China and all of these kinds of things. How do you see that? I, like, I, I, I see both sides. So I think 
what U.S. is good is, I think both countries are very, very good and have a promising future. And I think maybe China is picking up speed now, but like as a you know as a curve goes, it can. It's not a straight line. It's not a linear relationship. It will always go to a certain extent that it will still grow, but at a slower speed, which is happening right now for China's economy, as we see. Um, you know, despite the COVID impact, it's expected actually to slow down the growth by 2020, and it did. And now that's why I don't know if you are following with the stock issues like a few months back. There was a crackdown on Alibaba, on basically all the big companies, big tech companies in China. Um, I think what they want, what they're trying to do is to, they always say like to do it their way in a way that's not fully capitalist, but they need to be capitalism. They need to adopt capitalism for the past 10 years in order to build up the momentum, in order to, um, absorb all the offshore funds to to China to build out like factories and more like you know U.S. dollars or like British British pound to make it more to make even RMB a more tradable coin in the world. So I think it's grow China is growing but definitely so slowing down. I think for U.S. I think U.S. The thing about U.S. is everybody wants to be here. And I think that's the one thing that can just be everything, like any other country. Like, it doesn't matter how great China is. I don't think people want to go to China to work <laughs> or to live, right? Like for people who are not from there, of course, my parents, they're, you know, they're having the best life in China. Like when they're in the States, they, they feel like everything is, you know, so outdated, you know, the, the, you know, everything is so crazy. They don't, they don't like it at all. And they were in California, which is like the, the most beautiful states probably like in in US. They found America outdated? Yeah, they think the infrastructure is very old, the trains, the bus, because they're very used to, you know, take public transportations. And in LA, there's no problem, like the bus is really disgusting. And so, yeah, they're like, this is crazy. We don't we don't like it here. If I have to drive to everywhere, 40 minutes, no, we don't like it here. But I mean, that's you know, because they were brought up in a in a very tight knitted community back in back at home. So that's why it's very hard for them to to get out, to adopt. What do you think about these video game limits? Oh, <laughs> I think those. I think those are good. Like in a way, of course, you shouldn't be, you know, infringe personal liberty. But I do think those are for the kids. And I think there's a, of course, there's, there's always ways for the kids to get around that. You know, they're gonna figure a way out. But I think that's, you know, it's a very, it's like a very harsh measure. And that's what you know the government policies always are. Um, it's always black and white dichotomy it's either you play those you you play this time or you don't you we set a limit or we don't have a limit and i think you know as long as it's for the kids i think it's good because at least for the years that i was in china i think because education is a huge thing in china like it's much much bigger than what it is in the u.s it's like one of the most profitable industry in china and by most profitable, I mean like billions of dollars a year. Yeah. And that's like same as big pharma, same as oil companies, because there is this push. So recently there is a pushback to say, maybe we should, you know, lessen the load for the, for the students. So that's why they're taking a lot of the, because in China you go to, like for me, I went to a very, like a public school, but the public school is it's a very competitive public school. So it's, it's very crazy. It, you, so you basically, you have class like for my starting from seventh grade because every, uh, okay, let me back up. So like from year one to sixth grade, that's a period, that's your elementary school. 
So that's, you know, you can have your kid, a lot of parents that do let their kids to learn piano instruments, but then you, ha you have to take like eight classes a day. And I mean, eight classes. And you probably have like a 30 minute like lunch nap, but that's it. So from Monday to Friday, that's your grade, first grade to sixth grade, which is very different from here. I, I, you know, everybody's off by two. <laughs> because you know, I, I went to a school that's K through 12. So I see everybody off at two. I'm like, what, what, what is going on? So how and long is the school day? The school day is from 7.30 to, uh, to six, to six. So that's, that's your elementary school. That's like the uh, easy mode. And then you go into middle school. Middle school is really tough because seventh grade, seventh grade to ninth grade. So basically those, after, after middle school, you have to take an exam, like a, like a SAT, but it's not really, because SAT is a, it's still elective in a way. It's like, yeah, you know, if you want to go to Brown, yeah, you have to take SAT, but like, you don't have to go to Brown. Right. Um, so, but in China, it's a mandatory test. So everybody has to take that one. And so you have to study really hard for that. And that course low will be like the school, typical school day in middle school is probably like 7.30 to 7.30. So you, yeah. So you basically spend the whole day at school. So you, you, you really get to know your friends. Uh, you, <laughs> that is that thing and yeah that was really it was really tough it was really tough and then yeah I, I was lucky I didn't get to take, take the test that test must be hard was it, when you came here and, and you transitioned it sounded like it was very laid back right yeah I, yeah, yeah yeah it's very it's very laid back I think it's just because I always love like when I was in middle school, I was, I was I was in love with playing basketball all day, like all day, every day. I watch basketball, I play basketball, I go home, I play get basketball games. Like, and then when I first came here, I realized I can do all that. Like I have the time to do all that and enjoy with friends. Like, I just feel like when I came here, like, things are actually clicking for me like for my interests the things i like to do join the basketball team doing what i like studying it's it's definitely tough because as i was saying like language was actually a barrier for me first when i when i first came to this country because the english they taught you back home is more like hey how are you i'm good thank you like it's a very like fixed conversation it's not you don't really having a conversation you are not translating your thoughts into English and say, mm -hmm. say it out loud. You are just like memorizing things. So like when I first came here, it's, yeah, it's very difficult because a lot of the classes there already be like basically taught English and you got to read the book. You got to, you know, listen to lectures and you got to do homework and that's all in English. So I basically went through like a English as a second language program for about six months before I jumped to uh, the regular program, the regular eighth grade program. Did you experience any Asian hate? Definitely not when I was in California. California is, uh, yeah, I think that's just, that's La La Land. That's the very different, like people, yeah, they don't, I don't think they, they don't see colors, they don't see, nationalities because i i guess they're just exposed to so many so you know what i guess by speaking out that way that shows you are really ignorant that you are not really a uh, from la or like from california and but i think when i came like more east side i definitely did uh experience some i wouldn't say like racism but i like, I, I would think like people will look at me different and just because how I look and, but I learned to be like, you know, I, I know who I am. You don't like that. That's, that's your problem. And I can't, where did, where I can't fix that for you. I came to the East coast on my second year of college. So sophomore year. So I, that, 
well, that's not really East Coast because I went to Indiana University first for their uh, Cali School of Business because I, I was I was really into business school at the time. Yeah, that's another thing about me. Like when I'm very interested in something, I I just I go. I tell my parents as I'm done with this. I have to I have to go to this school right now. But a lot of time those you know those I would say passions will also come with a cost. Like I didn't expect what the weather will be like, what the people over there will be like, but the leaving my comfort zone, but actually comfort zone, it's, yeah, you need to leave your comfort zone, but you also need to figure out comfort zone can sometimes be a support system for you too. So I think that's one of the thing when I first moved out, I realized like I didn't take account of any of that. Like I was just there by myself, uh, yeah, making new friends, but it's actually very difficult. And I realized, you know, and that year with the, the course low is crazy too. Um, I was I just wasn't really keeping up with that. Did you do your first year in college before you moved to Indiana? Yes. So I did I did one year in UCLA for mechanical engineering, and I really hated engineering afterwards. Uh, <laughs> Because there's just like so many crazy classes that you have to take. So I basically pivoted my, my interest to business and I realized business is really not the thing because I guess I'm like naturally, I love to share my ideas. So a lot of the classes about public speaking, about I, I think that's like a waste of my time because I don't need someone else to teach me how to talk. That's how I talk and for finances, I think that's basically like, that's very basic math for me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, just that's nothing. And, and I really hate accounting. So, so I was like, mm, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So basically after that year, that year was a, a little bit hard. I think the weather is definitely a big hit first. I didn't realize that it's going to snow that much. Like I know it's going to snow, but not that much. Mm. And it's cold and the winter is long. And that definitely, you know, didn't help with my mood. Doesn't like, I basically lost all motivations to do work. And I was having a very bad semester, like a spring semester that year. And yeah, after that, I was like, you know, I have to check in with myself about like be real with myself like what do you know what do you really want do you really want to study business like or because you look good with a business degree from the school right so after i checking with myself on that that that's basically my bottom line like what do i actually want to do and i realized i want to move more east i want to basically move to the east coast but before that, I still need to complete my degrees. And what schools should I go to? And I have a professor at the time. He was like, like a mentor. He really helped me. Like during those difficult times, I was really lost. I didn't know what, else, you know, what, what can I do? And he think, basing on my degree reports, I have an interest in like economy, like economics. And also some like statistic things. You think I'll, I'll be I'll do good with those two like together to do something interesting because those are like a hard skill that you acquire that you not really likely going to forget about it. And you think that you know Penn State will be a great. He basically referred me to Penn State um, for those two those the, the double degree program. So yeah, I was really. You know, we still stay in touch. And yeah, I really thank him for, you know, helping me at the time and be the person that's, because there were a lot of prejudice in uh, Indiana. There is a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say racism, but like there is a lot of people will be working against you. Like they don't want to work with you. They just do not want to work with you. And yeah, that, that, that was a spark of light in the dark. So yeah, 
I still keep in touch with the professor because I think you you know you should always you should always be grateful for someone to do that for you. So that must have been a shock. You moved to California eighth grade. You you had no issues there, and then you show up to Indiana, and then it's like there was a big shock there. Was it a how what was that like for you? I think that was the first. The first like welcome to America moment for me, like that because yeah that was because I th I don't think California uh, yeah California is part of America but it that's like if you say you are from America like I would expect you to be from like Chicago or like Midwest like that's a, that's the real America I guess that's the most majority of America is about and when I was there yeah I was meeting. I was facing like a lot of like legit culture shock. Like people are driving trucks. People think this is cool, and you know, sports cars are not cool. People think SUVs are cool. People think, uh, you know, being huge, big, like strong, like playing football, that's cool, but not, you know, being nimble and playing on bat. Like, it's not really big on basketball. I mean. I, but the school is kind of bigger, basketball. But like nobody really care about it. But yeah, that was a that was a shock for me at first. Like everything challenged your value system a little. So, what was the Asian community like in Indiana? Not much. There was um, mostly international students, and yeah, that's it. Just international students. So you did you gel with them or were at that point you were more American than Chinese? No, I think at, at the time I was really like most of my friends are still international students. So I would say, I would say like, I'm, but I'm getting starting to get a taste of interacting with people that's outside of my race that maybe not seeing the same perspective as I, I see them, because at the same time I was having like two other roommates. And there were, I think one, one of them, they are Hispanic and the other is white. And they were, you know, we're just hanging out, shooting the shit. And yeah, that gives me a different perspective on America. Because back in California, we'll be doing, you know, and you will be hanging out with other people, but then you are still doing Asian things. You would go to Asian restaurants, you were drinking boba teas, you know, still in that bubble. Uh, even, and they are trying to accommodate to your culture, uh, my culture, I mean. And then, you know, in Indiana, you kind of have to cater to other people's culture as well. Then you got a taste of other cultures and you realize, it's, you know, it's actually cool. It's very, very different, but still cool. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a big thing. That's a big shock too for me. Do you think Indiana or Penn State would have been easier? Like which one would have been easier? I think definitely Penn State because even though it's in central Pennsylvania, but but it's actually very liberal. Everybody is very liberal and it's a college town. It's much, very much like Princeton, like in, in terms of environments, like people have their, cute houses in the downtown area streets are always clean and when there's a big game going on everybody got wasted and you know just crazy college town vibe i really like that um you know that kind of makes you feel belong to that place and easier to blend yeah. in very easy to blend in yeah yeah you, you have identity instantly i mean so for me, I like the story of the other and America integrating this melting pot, all of these different groups coming together and America is not one specific thing, right? It's not yeah. those pickup trucks, you know, it's, it's a melting pot style. And there's certain places in, in America that's very homogeneous. And then there's other places that's very liberal and mixed and all of these things. So yep. I'm, I'm kind of glad that you got Indiana in there. So you can, there's some people who's never been to a place like Indiana. Yeah. 
you know, and they yeah. have no idea what it's like to be in a town of 50,000 people and, you know, being one person who, who's not white or whatever. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's, you can get a lot of understanding of America from that. And if you, if you stayed in California, you may not have seen or got to know that, you know. That's for sure. That's for sure. That's when I, you know, when I was having tough times, uh, I always look back, you know, like all this setbacks or whatever, like struggles. I think those are good because they make me more resilient to the challenges that I will eventually face. Like when I move to anywhere, uh, that's, you know, that's not everywhere is going to be welcoming. If you go to a welcoming place, you should be thankful that it's welcoming, but it's not a default. And I think it's, it gives me the, the teeth to fight through, like when I'm in unwelcoming circumstances, but I still need to put, push through because I have a goal. I have, things, I have places where I want to go. Um, and not to just take that as an excuse, like be like, oh, you know, this is not for me. And yeah, I think that those experiences really sharpen me as a person. Now, one of the things that I heard about China was that they put a limit on the amount of kids you can have. It, was, that, yeah, no. was that still true? Not anymore. I think two years ago, they, that they, they're, they're right now encouraging you to have more kids. I think that's more for my parents' generation. They can only have one kid. Yeah, so that's, so I'm the only child in the house. So are all my friends. Only one kid. And only one kid. And there was also like an issue with having girls. Yes. So yeah, they definitely prefer boys more than girls. And that actually has, um, you know, the lingering effect is already, it's already taking place in China right now. It's actually very difficult for a regular man. And I mean, regular man, meaning like, you know, a man goes to nine to five, make average salary, have a house, have a car. Even then he can't find a spouse because the market is really shrinking. That, you know, there's not enough women to mate with every man. It's like one to 1.6, like one, one women to 1.6 men. So what about the 0.6 men are going to do with their life? They're not going to match with a, you know, a girl in the market. But so yeah, so it's kind of crazy. And now also there's a, you know, population is getting older, much, much older. So that's why they're encouraging my generation to have more kids. Uh, but I think one of the way that you incentivize people to have kids is to have a, to have a better infrastructure. It's like for me in US, I, I could have three kids because I know even if I'm out of work, the government is going to help. I know there is or something is going to help me to pay through all that expenses. But if the infrastructure is not there, I don't really believe in the system, then of course I'm not gonna have kids. So I think that's one of the, just another social movement in China that uh, around my generation that people don't wanna have kids at all because they don't really buy into the system. They don't believe there is a support behind all of this. Like after the decision that they do, they, they don't think they're, they're being backed off. They, they, they feel like they're forever indebted if they have a kid. Um, so what's going on in the politics over there? I think right now, after after the president Xi took over in twenty I think twenty twelve, it's it's getting less liberal, less capitalism, and less free market. So more government interference, more regulations, more crackdowns. Um, yeah, so right now I think in China the whole point, the political crackdown on like corruptions and but you know those co 
well, my perspective is always, if you say you are going to crack down corruption, then you mean you are the justice. Then it's very easy to wear the hat and just to eliminate your enemy in a way. Because there, even though there's only one party in China, but there is, uh, you know, within the party, of course, there, there's a, the, of course, there are going to be different forces at work. Like for say like one, like it's more like an oligarchy than a communism society. So like a few big family, like the big family take over a few key industries. And if, and not all of them are agreeing with uh, Chairman Xi's decisions, uh, how he sees China, how he positions China in the international market. Because a lot of them, they are, they're like me, they're foreign educated, they came back and then they use the resource they have at home to, to build empire themselves. So they're very thinking very much like an entrepreneur, a US, a Western educated entrepreneur. Um, and that's really going against to everything that um, Chairman Xi is trying to impose on the society. So he's trying to restrict international connections? He is trying to, I think he's, he, yes, definitely. That's one of the thing. I think he doesn't want, he doesn't want more foreign interference for their um, China affairs. Um, I think he is, because he's afraid that those maybe US council might, might bought up some people in the party, within the party and cause a chaos, like a CIA operations happening again in China, which I understand, you know, of course there's a concern. But I think he is right now because he's grippling the, he basically changed the law, like the law in China before was saying the constitution law. So basically every four years, there has to be a new leader. And he basically overruled that. He said, I, I will rule for life. And a lot of people will see that as a bad, as a, you know, you are going to be a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, but from my per perspective, I think that's actually a, that's actually a smart move uh, because not only for him, but also that's like a win-win situation for him and China because China right now is really like, it's growing, as I was saying, it's growing by slowing its speed, and, but it's still growing. So then in, you need less distractions from, from politics and to focus more on growing that part and try to reinvest all the money that you already acquired. And China, you know, it's like a stock market, right? Like you, you, you don't wanna just go down, you wanna like trend up again after you go down a little bit. And, and I think one leader right now would be, would be good for the country for now at least in terms of its greater good growth. But you will never know. Those things always have like ripple effects. Maybe this one thing will scare other foreign invest investor to en enter the China market, which I do see a lot before, uh, because I used to work for Alibaba and maybe mostly my job is trying to talk with the uh, US brands or European brands to enter China market. And a lot of times the question that they ask is that how much of government policy will be in play, um, will be affecting this whole market growth. And my answer is always, you will never know, but the, you, ne you never know when the policy will hit you and, or if the policy will help you. But the policy definitely change a lot like for the market. So a lot of them, they want to position themselves in China, but not as a, it's more like after, you know, like a company after they, they make all their investments in a year and they have a few, like maybe like 5%, 5% to spend and they want to do something risky, then they will put it in China because that 5% might grow to 50%, but it also can be to 0% if the policy clamps down on you. So, yeah. So I think the China right now, it's, was supposed to go become the politics world was supposed to be more volatile and right now with only one leader and one majority party 
I think it become less volatile and people are focusing more on making things, doing things, making animes, making games. Um, yes, which I think is the right direction to go because those are, those are the things that turns you from a manufacturing giant to a world leader like the US. Because those, those are the industry that involves a lot of innovation, a lot of thinking, and a lot of entrepreneurs will, will emerge from that competition. And I think in overall, that'll be, that'll be great for China's economy. What about you know, Nike sweatshops and all of those kinds of things? I think those are still happening, but I think as uh, as the economy goes, um, as China economy become better, better catching up to U.S., so is the web, labor wage. So, you know, like you can you can only pay them pennies still, but thing is, if the food in China costs just like U.S., then you can't pay them pennies anymore because they still have to eat. They have to leave somewhere. And so I think that will eventually fade out in China because they will be replaced by cheaper labor in other places in Asia. Uh, I think Vietnam is definitely one of them. And uh, yeah, and then maybe India. India is great too. What about, um, I heard China is investing a lot in Africa. Have you been yes. seeing that trend? Yes, yes, yes. I think. That's another, I think that's, that's a way for China to like have more influence for the world uh, because basically they were trying to work with a lot of deals with Europe, but EU is much, it's still like a little brother to the US. Um, so they will do deals with you, but when the bigger brother tell him, hey, don't because this, they are my competitors. Right. You know, don't do, don't do it. And then they will stop. And then so China don't really see Europe as a strategic alliance. So I think they are trying to have strategic alliance from the start. And of course, Africa is the is the is the next, basically the next China. The next yeah, definitely has the population mass that it needs. And I think right now you also have the resources, also. All, all you wait for is capital to flow in. And I think it shouldn't be long for even for Africa to, to be a major player in the, in the international market. What, what do you see in America that still surprises you? Hmm. I think people are very simple. Like in a way, people are not simple, but I guess they are they're not very materialistic as I imagine they are should be. Like if you, you know, it's very it's very counterintuitive because it's a capitalist country. You would think everyone wants to have the most the best thing in the world, but it's not really true. Everybody has their own preference, taste, and it's really a game of whatever makes you tick. And that really surprises me because in China, there's always a, how do I say it? There's always a value system that everybody shares. So there are things that we all agree are very good. And if you have that, you're the king. You are, you're showing off some social status that's common across all people. Everybody will think you are the king. You're good, you're rich. If you have a Rolex in China, you're rich. Everybody thinks you're the rich, you're the richest guy, like on the block. But I don't think that works in over here because maybe in the city, you know, you're going in and out bars, hungry people, but definitely not in Indiana. <laughs> and, and I think even in New Jersey, I don't see that much. Like maybe in like the river road, maybe you see some very nice sports cars, but Consider the money that they have. It's, you know, it's actually nothing. It's nothing, and people actually just go for their interests. Like people who, meaning like people who drive sports cars, actually love sports cars. People like, they're not doing it to sh merely show off. 
they also have a strong interest in those as well. They understand cars, they're a car guy. And yeah, so that's really surprises me that how, how deep this individualism can go. So in a country like America, where you think everyone would be into materialism, you still find people who with money aren't materialistic and people, if you're wearing a Rolex, it's not because you're showing a status symbol, it's because you actually like watches. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's very surprising to me. Because yeah. people, I would say 90, 90 percent of people who are in China wear Rolex, they don't know a thing about watch. They don't know a thing about watch. The only the only thing they care about is what the watch brings to them, like their respect and the social approvals. A lot of what I'm hoping to accomplish here is to just break down some of the the walls that we have around differences, right? Do you feel like insulated as an Asian American? Like I, I know that we're in the Northeast and we're more liberal, but do you feel like, you know, everyone kind of stays to themselves? Do you feel integrated? Like, how do you see this whole thing? I, well, I think, I think there's a, there's a two part to that question. So I think one, when you're in school or in any organizations, it's very easy for you to, to feel belong to and because there's already infrastructure set up for you to social with people, to get to know people. I think those are the best, but I think if, um, if I were to quit my job today and to just retire. And I think I will feel really like insulated in my own circle because there are definitely places that you, I mean, you can go, but like you, you will feel like a very outsider. Like if you go to, let's say a country club, like for say, I just like to golf, for example, I don't, but <laughs> I want to go to a country club, but I will feel very, very out of place because that will be a, very dominant, really white man dominated place. And in that way, I feel very out of place, but yeah. So, so what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying is I think U.S. has a very interesting way to those institutions to set you up for success, success. but uh, after you out of that institution or organizations, it's on you. And when it's on you, it's actually not you. You, I, I began to realize how important those support system, those those people who lead uh, each cause, each meetings, um, are essential to like break down the walls that you were talking about. And there are definitely a lot of walls. So. Do you, have you seen any racism since you've been here, whether yourself or other people? I think over here, it's, um, it's definitely less, but when you, if you like go a little bit north, like to, I'll say like, even in Jersey, like Alpine, Crestcal area, people look at you different. Like, I mean, I mean, great, different. And, you know, I was shocked the other day because I was just driving through the neighborhood. I was like, you know, because my parents always tell me eh, that, you know, the houses in Alpine is so pretty, you know, even though they're like crazy mansions, but like you should definitely like look into that. If there's any like houses being renovated, maybe we can ask for a price or whatever. Um, so I was basically driving over there just trying to see houses, you know, just not being nosy, just solely driving. And yeah, the neighbor, the neighbors, they look at me crazy. They think I am like, like they give me the eyes that, you know, like when people look at you and they, they want to make you feel like you're don't like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, um, like none of your business. Like, what do you mean? Like, I just, this, this is the public road. But yeah, that's definitely one of the incidents that I, that I had recently. That was not really pleasant. But 
Um, I was having a conversation about artificial intelligence and, you know, basically the conversation right now is that 60% of the jobs in the next 10, 15 or 20 years are going to be replaced by computers. Yeah. Are you seeing that trend? How do you feel about that? I think that's great. I think a lot of people, they, I think that's why they, a lot of people hate their jobs because it's, humans are not supposed to do repetitive tasks. They are supposed to do things that involve the critical thinking and that interest them. I think that's why a lot of people grow, you know, jaded. I think the jaded process is that to make you, to make you like pour water into a glass and then pour it out. Pour water in a glass, pour it out. Imagine doing that all day, that's going to drive you insane. And even though you're gonna get some rewards, like a couple bucks afterwards, but you, you're, not, you're not enjoying the process and that's detrimental for your mental health. So I think AI is actually the solutions for that. I think the way that AI goes in US, I think is very promising. I think that's, you know, the, basically US took a, took a red pill and China took a blue pill. Like there's, those, those two are the very different approaches. So US is more thinking of at least what it's showing right now. Most thinking of replacing repetitive jobs, but that's not only, it's not that that job is gone. The, the, rep, the repetitive process is gone. There is going to be a new job created after, because I think this one thing that we always have is a fixed mindset. We always think, we think in terms of scarcity. We think in terms of if somebody took $1 off my back, then I am $1 short, but not really, because if that, that, you know, maybe your bag become bigger, your bag become $200, become $300. Then what's that $1 will do? That, that, that's, that's, that's the amount that you need to create a bigger pie. And so I think it's actually a good thing. And I think, you know, companies like, Boston Dynamics, I saw a lot of their robots, you know, dancing, do a lot of weird movements, like black backflips. I think it's amazing how like techno technologically advanced that we are uh, in certain areas. And I think in the future, maybe like there will be no warehouse workers that have to carry like, I don't know, God knows like hundred pounds of boxes every day and break this shin and you know, just make people's life more easier. Like they don't have to do hard work in order to make money, but they can do more creative work because I think that's one part that AI will never be able to like reproduce because it doesn't, it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't really know what it is. It knows the current task, do that. But it doesn't think of what I, what it is like why am i doing it here they stop at the why stage and i think it gives us more time to think about the why do you invest yes i do what do you invest in i think mostly right now it's mostly mutual funds like majority of my portfolio is in mutual funds because it's safe and i think you know, U.S. stock is just going to go high and high, higher. And other things, like more risky things, I would like to do like some crypto, some Bitcoin, some Ethereum. And I don't touch Dogecoin because I think that's too risky. And maybe some like Chinese company stocks because recently they take a big hit. So they're really like cheap in terms of their price as well. And I think they're going to bounce back eventually. Um, which companies in particular? Uh, so I think Alibaba is definitely going to bounce back. Uh, one time in, I think in July this year, it hit 220. Now it drops down to 160 a share. And yeah, definitely going up. I, I think that's a safe bet. Yeah, because if you think about it, it's not like Amazon. Amazon is not only doing e-commerce, they're also doing entertainment, they're doing Amazon Prime, 
they also they also have a logistic system that helps them ship stuff. So they are actually a delivery company too. And so for those companies, it's very hard for them to lose money because they are in so many different industries. So I think it's always a safe bet. And now after you know the market scare is over, that people are going to have trust in those stocks again. So the prices that I think they're expected to grow. And on a personal note, you're recently married. Yes, thank you. Congratulations, yes. man. How does it feel? I think it, it definitely gave me a sense of accountability, like even more. I'm always very, like I like to take accountability for myself, but right now you have another person to take accountability too. Um, you not only have to check yourself, but you also have to check, you know, as a as a couple, how 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 much you are gelling with each other, and if there is any issues, we need. We, I will always want to address it first. Um, yeah, so it becomes a uh, team sports. <laughs> yeah, in a way. Awesome. Now. With all of these things going on, do, do you ever see yourself living in China again? It's hard. It's definitely very hard. I had that thought last year. Um, you know, when COVID hit, uh, I really wanted to see my parents because you know, their parents and my family is all back at home. And, you know, I just want to make sure they're okay. And I want to also be there during this difficult time that everybody's staying at home and, um, you know, you can, must be difficult also for them as well. Um, but I don't really see myself going back, like living back home, like maybe going back for visiting just because how much of my, like the value system that I changed, that changed throughout these years. And I really enjoy, I value my own personal space and time and how I would like to use them. And, um, it's just like, it's like, it's like if I'm home, then I'm really not really myself. I'm like my previous China version of Victor. So you, um, you've grown into an identity now that's more American. I'll say. And you said that um, you grew up in um, Wuhan, China, is that right? Yes. Now, what would you like to clear up about this whole COVID thing and Wuhan? Uh, I think it, the origin of the virus, it could be in Wuhan. It could be, it definitely could be, but it's definitely not the places where they say it was. Um, like what they say it was from the wet market. I think that's uh, just, uh, I don't know, that, that's to build like a rhetoric. Um, to say, because, you know, everybody in US knows the stereotypical um, Chinese eat every animal type of things. So it actually like make intuitive sense for people to, you know, connect the dots. Um, but I, you know, it could be, it could be, because um, it's very interesting before, I didn't even know. I didn't even know like how, how deep the rabbit hole is. So I, when I was in quarantine, I did like a thorough research on just what is like, because there is a level four lab in China that's doing gain of, I think what's it called? Gain of function research. So those are trying to test out the virus's capability to basically make a more potent virus. Um, and that research is also funded by US as well. So the lab itself is not, it's an international lab. It's not only owned by Chinese government, it's basically in China, but it's like a UN. Uh, they have found from France, UK, and also US, large amount of from US. And I think it's very interesting. It's very like, if we go to the conspiracy route, uh, rather than thinking who's at fault for this, uh, to think of when, when the whole thing happened, and how it actually impacted our current world. Uh, I think timing-wise, it's, 
it's too much of a coincidence. It happens right around the time where global economy is about to hit a, like growing at a slower speed. That may be a little bit apocalypse event is what it needs for you to pick it up again. That's well, that's that, that's my spiel, but <laughs> but I think I think it's definitely possible for its origin from from Wuhan, but who knows? Well, the interesting thing for me is that COVID is a virus that exists, right? We have hundreds yeah. of virus that we have under control all over the place, right? So this is just one of many viruses that they have in test tubes and labs that they study, that they do research on. And in, in China, people live in close proximity with their animals, which is going to be food. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, not, not really, not really, unless you are a farmer. Uh, they, it's like for the wet market, uh, that's like a farmer's market, but like you can buy different animals, but like I would definitely say it's, people don't eat weird animals. Like at least in my town, they don't, they don't eat exotic animals. They, they're mostly going there for food, for like fish, because like, they have different type of fish there too, hence wet market. And I think, yeah, I think I don't think that's true. I don't think people are living in close proximity with animals that can be their food. Uh, I think only farmers do that. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Do you want to leave yeah. us with any specific thoughts? Uh, I think, I guess my, it's just, you know, try different things. Uh, I know it's very hard for all of us to like take that first step, but like try different things. And those experiences will, will teach you, I will teach you a very different lessons that you had before. And they will teach you to always grow as a person and go forward. And whatever that gets you here, doesn't get you there. So you always have to figure out new things, new ways, how to, shape your mindset and the only way to do that is try new things how, how do you do that how do you motivate yourself to try new things um i think one of the best way to motivate yourself is just put yourself in new environments in new situations like i like for me i don't i, I guess like I can do a lot of different things, but I would never imagine myself talking to a camera like for, for over an hour, but I do it because, and after this experience, maybe you will spark uh, creative things in me too, like to do something like this. But if I don't do it at all, then I will never have even thinking about that. Like, I think that's the beautiful thing about, about life, it's about, a lot of people say this is a simulation. You always are stuck because I think we are very routine people. We're like, everybody's routine based. We always like to go to the restaurant that we already went. And I think it's just nice to think of, like I'm jumping out of the soup simulation for once. Like maybe I'm always going for this restaurant, but like today I'm going to the one next to it, like right next to it, and just to see. What's worse can happen? Bad meal, okay. Then noted, I will never go to that place again, but there's so much to gain. I think a lot of times we are thinking about making a new experience happen. We're always thinking about the worst that will come. Oh, I will look like a fool. I will, you know, I will waste my time or whatever. But you don't realize you, we don't realize we, we never lose the time. We just gain a new experience. And either way is good. Either way you win. So why not try new things and jump out of simulation for once, if this is simulation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Victor. I really appreciate the time. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward to more conversations in the future. Great. Thank you for having me.